please start. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Depends on which part of the world you are. <clears throat> my name is Dr. Chaudhary, and it's my privilege to welcome all of you to this NAFLD Conclave 2020. This is webinar number two. This webinar is going to really focus on what are the therapies we have on the table as doctors when we have to write a prescription for patients. And I'm deeply privileged to welcome the chairpersons for this session. Uh, we have four eminent stalwarts in hepatology. The first is Professor Subrat Acharya. I don't think he needs an introduction. He was uh, at All India Institute till recently, at the moment, Pro Vice Chancellor in, uh, in uh, Bhubaneswar. Uh, we have Dr. Abraham Koshi, who is a very eminent gastroenterologist from uh, Kerala. And uh, he had worked with uh, legendary uh, 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 people, you know, hepatologists in France, and he was my teacher as well. He served in the faculty at PGI Chandigarh and at Lucknow. At the moment, he's in Cochin. Then we have Professor S.P. Singh, uh, very eminent hepatologist. He has been the president and secretary of the INSL, which he has taken to great heights. At the moment, he's, I think, the president of the INSL, as well as uh, he's an active uh, luminary and a leader in ISG. And we have Dr. Ashokananda Konar, who's a very, very, uh, shall we say, uh, loved and admired hepatologist from West Bengal, from Calcutta. So I'll pass on to these uh, four people. Before that, I just have to tell you that I'm privileged to host this on behalf of HOPE Initiative. HOPE Initiative stands for Health Oriented Programs and Education. And we have been doing it this conclave for the last four years. This year, we are doing it in a web format. In the last three years, we have been, done it in direct uh, physical format. But nevertheless, welcome to all of you. And our star player today would be three speakers. And Dr. Arun Sanyal, I'll leave it to the chairpersons to do the honors. Over to you, Dr. Subrat Acharya and Dr. Ibrahim Koshi. Well, welcome to the, this second uh, webinar on uh, fatty liver disease being organized by Chaudhary. And uh, my pleasure and job, and this is a very interesting webinar. And because this is the direct practical aspect of the treatment of fatty liver disease, which we face in day to day life, one of the largest. Population at large throughout the world, and we call it a global. And we are going to discuss about that. And uh, to start the ball rolling, it is Dr. Arun Sanglyal. I will hand it over to Dr. Professor Abraham Kosi to introduce him and to introduce the subject. Professor Kosi. Professor Sanglyal requires no introduction as far as Nash is concerned. He is professor at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, Richmond, uh, United States. Uh, he has been working on NASH for several years and considered the most important figure as far as NASH research is concerned. So he will be giving us two talks. The first will be on what are the drugs currently available. And later towards the end, he will tell us what drugs we can look forward to. So, without uh, further ado, I request Professor Arun Sanyar to give us his first talk. Professor Arun Sanyar. Thank, thank you, Abraham. Uh, let me just share my screen very quickly. So, uh, um, in my first talk, what I would like to do is cover the current therapeutic targets and the clinical trials landscape. And the second talk will be in more detail talking about how to integrate the evidence that has been generated so far to determine what drug is best for your patient. So as you know, uh, there are different aspects to the development of NASH. Starting with a normal liver, in the presence of systemic insulin resistance, one develops steatosis. But in 
addition to the systemic effects which promote steatosis and inflammation, there are liver-specific uh, changes that lead to the progression to steatohepatitis. Steatohepatitis predominantly uh, leads to progressive fibrosis and eventually to cirrhosis. And so at different points in the course of the disease, there are different types of targets that are particularly relevant. Very early on, insulin resistance and changes in lipid metabolism are very important. And these are typically at a systemic level. As the disease progresses forward, hepatic lipotoxicity with downstream oxidative stress and other forms of cell injury become important. These then lead to inflammation, particularly activation of the innate immune system, which if severe enough can lead to cell injury and death. And then eventually this leads to a fibrogenic response. There are a large number of drugs that are currently in clinical trials. Many of these are actually in early phase. I'm going to talk, sort of walk you through sort of what the landscape looks like. And this is, you know, it is not possible to put each and every drug that is currently being studied on one slide because you would not be able to read the slide at all. So these are just to give you an example uh, for a key targets and some drugs that are targeting these uh, agents from PPAR gammas, bioglitazone that you already know, GLP-1s with liraglutide and semaglutide, and uh, then other additional uh, compounds such as ACC inhibitors, steroid coid desaturases, SGLT2, so on and so forth. Now I will leave these slides for you guys to be available, for them to be available to you, so that if you do want to look at individual things, uh, you can look them up yourself uh, later on. So I won't bore you by reading each and every line on these slides. Now let's talk about metabolic agents in phase two. And these are trials which are typically done without a biopsy. And the primary readout is improvement in steatosis and an improvement in liver enzymes. And so uh, there are some newer drugs over here. There's aldosterone receptor antagonist that is being studied. There are second generation FXR agonists. So the Enya drug is already, I think they've got some preliminary data out there, which is looking promising, but there's a lot of pruritus associated with it. And there are other uh, targets, which are such as this multifactorial lipid modulator, which is also currently in study. There's a whole slew of additional compounds, particularly starting with the FXR agonist Enya, liposine is a uh, drug which has been tested. We've published this actually, uh, showing that uh, in hypogonadal males, uh, there's a very high prevalence of fat, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And if you just correct their hypogonadism, the fatty liver disease improves in a large number of patients. So this is something that downstream, when you do see your patients with fatty liver disease, particularly if they're significantly obese and they have some erectile dysfunction or other things going on. It may not be simply a vascular issue. It's not a bad idea to check for hypogonadism in this population. Axella, uh, this is a uh, set of uh, compounds, which is nutrition-based therapy. And in previous talks, I had focused on this concept of metabolic flexibility and inflexibility. So these are essentially designed to break metabolically inflexible state and make sure that the mitochondria have enough nutrients so you're not breaking down muscle mass. And at the same time, by preserving the muscle mass, it improves the ability to oxidize fatty acids and thereby reduce the amount of fatty acids going to the liver. And so here are other compounds that are already in current development. And uh, so, um, uh, these should all be coming out uh, soon. Now, moving on to phase two drugs, which are phase 2B, which is efficacy-based outcomes. If you look at the estimated readout, we know the Viking final readout uh, came out at the end of uh, last year. And uh, uh, then there are a number of additional compounds that are coming out this year. 
probably very notable over here is NGM 282, which is a FGF 19 analog. Uh, and this will read out the final results will come out uh, in, um, I guess, the fourth quarter. Uh, Saroglidazar, uh, we will hear a lot more about, but there is a phase two study uh, which will be present, submitted, has been submitted to ASLD, and the results will be presented uh, at ASLD. And obviously, there's a trial that's been completed in India, which led to its approval. There's a whole slew of additional compounds. Again, you can see FXRs, various PPARs, GLPs. These are all targeting early phase metabolic uh, endpoints. Uh, Seldalapar, unfortunately, uh, last year development was stopped because of concerns for hepatotoxicity. Subsequently, it has been shown that these were probably not appropriate and there was no real signal for hepatotoxicity. But the, to my knowledge, uh, further development remains paused and halted at this point in time. And uh, interestingly, there are other uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid derivatives, iposabutate is one such, that modifies lipid metabolism, particularly generation of inflammatory eicosanoids, uh, such as lipoxygenases, et cetera, in NASH. And the, these data should be available early next year. Uh, Pegbelfermin is a uh, FGF21 analog. Uh, this is from Bristol Myers. Two very good studies and uh, highly well-powered studies looking at stage three and stage four patients with uh, NASH. Uh, these are fully enrolled and these will read out in the first part of next year. Now let's look at, uh, uh, again, anti-inflammatory molecules. Uh, there's a lot of interest in the uh, SSAO inhibitor. I think the early results came out last year. Not that exciting. The, there was some signal for improvement, but because there was CNS penetration, uh, SSAO, if you remember, are monoamine oxidase inhibitors, and uh, they have carry a fair amount of side effects, and so that molecule is not being developed any further. There are other molecules that are being studied. Some of these, you know, were projected, but they have not really, the results have not so far come out. Uh, and there are other trials looking at NK cells. There is less interest in the inflammatory targets now because of the understanding that there is a growing proliferation of inflammatory signaling that goes on as the disease progresses. And if you just hit one target without uh, treating the upstream metabolic root cause, the disease continues to progress. And then looking at more advanced phase, you know, unfortunately, a lot of things have read negative. Uh, Emrica San is a caspase inhibitor. Not only did, were the results negative, but it showed that when a cell is destined to die, if you block that death pathway, it figures out a different way to die, and the injury is actually more severe. Similarly, uh, Ceylon uh, trials were negative. There are some combo trials that are going on. Uh, the initial results uh, have come out. Uh, you know, to me, uh, the, the data just don't look like game changers to, to invest in combination therapeutics. And then Tropifexor, we will see the results at ASLD this year. Then moving on to phase three, which is closest to the end. Again, a lot of failures. Elafibrinor, complete failure, uh, you know, with no signal for efficacy. And uh, further development of this compound for NASH has now been stopped. OCA, you guys are quite familiar with. We'll hear a lot more about OCA. Uh, Madrigals, thyroxine beta receptors looking good. It is well underway, uh, but it's still early days for recruitment. COVID has slowed everything down by six months. So, you know, everything will be shifted by about six months. Aramcol is another molecule, which is a fatty acid, bile acid conjugate, and is a sterol co coid desaturase inhibitor. And uh, this is also an ongoing trial, still actively recruiting. So we still have a long ways to go. <laughs> if you look at antifibrotics, Silonsertiv has failed. Uh, Belapectin, to my reading, you know, if it didn't meet the primary endpoint and in a secondary analysis in a 
there was no dose dependency and in one of the lower doses a subset showed improvement uh, they are taking that subset and using that as a basis for a second phase 2b trial my sense is anytime you do that it's always high risk because if there's a subset that got better then there must be a subset that also got worse and so uh, in the absence of dose dependency not meeting up p value and having a subset that actually uh, based on all subset analysis uh, doesn't make i'm not that confident about its future senec rivarock is a ccr2 ccr5 which is fully enrolled and hopefully uh, this will read out uh, in uh, sometime next year uh, uh, with its uh, initial uh, outcome results for two year outcome results so as you can see the field remains very busy but uh, there have clearly been drugs that have uh, many drugs that have failed there are a handful of drugs that are still working and we're going to hear more about two of the drugs that are lead contenders which is OCA and uh, saraglitazar today back to you thank you arun for uh, that excellent overview including phase 2 trials back to uh, subrat is taking over to call the next speaker Uh, and the first of his is the oldest, that is vitamin E, started from Piran's trial by Professor Sanyal, where he compared vitamin E, bioglitazone, and placebo. And there are many uh, years have passed, and uh, I think um, there is the data that uh, uh, what is the actual benefit of vitamin E as far as the inflammation and fibrosis is concerned. What is the duration of the drug which you can use? What happens if you stop the drug? And has it actually influenced the uh, liver-related complications like cancer, cirrhosis, and liver-related deaths? To speak about vitamin E to us, we have Professor Dr. Kausal Madan, a very eminent and bright and young hepatologist doing wonderful work. He is our Secretary General of Indian National Association of Study of Liver and has been instrumental to bring in tremendous progress to the society. Dr. Madan, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Acharya, for those kind words. And thanks to Dr. Chaudhary for inviting me for this particular meeting. Uh, let me just share my slides with you. Uh, are my slides visible? Okay, so uh, pharmacotherapy of NAFL and the role of vitamin E. So where does vitamin E act in the uh, pathogenesis of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? You just heard Dr. Sanyal tell you that one of the major second hits, or if you are a believer of multiple hits, one of the major subsequent hits in, a, in the pathogenesis of NASH is oxidative stress, which leads from the stage of pure fatty liver to the stage of NASH, liver fibrosis, cirrhosis, or liver cancer or liver failure. So long time back, we did this study in small number of patients where we demonstrated that patients who have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease have a significantly higher uh, oxidative stress with lipid peroxidation products as compared to healthy controls as well as those who had chronic hepatitis. So let's start with a representative case. This is a 49-year-old gentleman, a case you see in your daily clinical practice, a 49-year-old gentleman, obese with a BMI of 28.4, diabetic and hypertensive for seven years, poorly controlled diabetes, recently detected on executive health check to have an ALT of 86. A fibro scan was done, revealed a LSM value of 8.2 kilopascal and a cap of 320. Obviously, like most of these patients, he refused a liver biopsy for further evaluation. So the questions are, obviously this patient is diabetic and having insulin resistance. Does vitamin E, when you give vitamin E to such a patient, what all you want to achieve? So does vitamin E reduce insulin resistance? This is data from Pivan's trial, Dr. Sanyal is sitting here. When they looked at the changes in insulin resistance from baseline, uh, 
vitamin E was not better than placebo in improving insulin resistance and this goes well with its mechanism of action where it targets not the first hit but the subsequent oxidative stress and necroinflammation part of the pathogenesis and obviously there was an improvement in insulin resistance with pioglitazone so for a patient when a patient comes to you he wants to see his alt going down so does vitamin e reduce the alt levels again data from pivans trial 247 adult non diabetic non cirrhotic nash patients randomized to placebo 800 milli international units of vitamin e or 30 mg pioglitazone per day for 96 weeks and as you can see right from the first month there was a significant reduction in the alt levels both in the vitamin e and pioglitazone group which continued for about 6 months and remained there as long as vitamin e was given but remember most of this these graphs these are this this line is hovering around 40 international units per uh, liter while we have learned after the introduction of daas for hepatitis c that enzymes when they become normal can go down as low as 15 17 20 25 and obviously recently we have known that the cutoffs the upper limit of cutoffs for alt have been reduced both for males and females so still there is some uh, uh some something still left after vitamin e once the enzymes come down to 40 possibly there some more uh, can be added some more drug can be added or some more intervention can be added which may bring down the necro inflammation further so does vitamin e we know that it reduces alt but does it improve histology so this was the result from tonic trial which was done in children 8 to 17 years of age again three arms two years of vitamin e or metformin or placebo the histological resolution was significantly better in the vitamin e arm as compared to placebo in the pivans trial the a priori uh, primary endpoint proportion showing histological improvement again was significantly better in the vitamin e arm as compared to placebo so it does improve histology does improve the necro inflammation part does improve uh, the Uh, ballooning part of non-alcoholic state of hepatitis, but does it improve fibrosis? We've all learned over last many years that possibly fibrosis is the driver of liver-related uh, uh, endpoints in patients who have advanced uh, NASH. So, does it improve fibrosis? So, this was a data analysis of Pivans trial, which where they correlated ALT response with histology. and as you can see that alt response correlated very well with improvement in the nas score as compared to non responders but when it came to fibrosis whether there was an alt response or no response there was no improvement in fibrosis not a significant improvement in fibrosis and that has been seen in other studies as well so you just heard dr acharya talk about whether it has any effect on clinically meaningful long term outcomes in patients who have liver disease or patients who have non alcoholic fatty liver disease so this was a study from dr chalasani's group although it was a retrospective study uh, they looked at patients who were prescribed vitamin e uh, 800 international units per day or placebo and followed them up for a median of 5.6 years interestingly almost two third patient had cirrhosis and almost two third patient had diabetes this is in contrast with the previous randomized controlled trials which had excluded diabetes which had excluded cirrhotic patients and they did show that the hepatic decompensation was significantly lower over long term in patients who received vitamin e versus placebo there was a significantly better transplant free survival in the group that was given vitamin e versus those who were not exposed to vitamin e and this difference was significant whether the patient had diabetes or did not have diabetes and not only that there was also a reduction in all cause mortality it was only about 10% in vitamin e and 33% in controls with a number needed to treat of 4.2 which was quite significant so that brings us back to that question because previous rct did not look at it is vitamin e effective even in diabetic nash population this guy which i presented on had diabetes for last 7 years 
So this was a proof of concept RCT in NASH patients with type 2 diabetes. Again, three groups. Here they had a placebo arm, vitamin E alone arm, and vitamin E plus pioglitazone. And pioglitazone here was 45 milligram in five months. It was 30 milligram per day. And this, these were given for 18 months. Again, you can see there was significant reduction in ALT levels and it, it persisted over time. Unfortunately, the primary outcome of achieving more than two point reduction in NAS score was not achieved in the vitamin E group, although it was numerically better. But the secondary outcome of resolution of NASH without worsening fibrosis was indeed achieved in the vitamin E group as compared to placebo. So vitamin E appears to be a drug which uh, benefits these patients by improving necroinflammation and improving histology and improving the ALT. But what might be the problems with long-term use of vitamin E? There's been data based on an earlier meta-analysis which said that uh, vitamin E is associated with higher all-cause mortality. But subsequent meta-analysis refuted this. 57 studies, more than 2.4 lakh patients, use of vitamin E over 10 years, no increase or decrease in all-cause mortality. The hazard ratio you can see is just one, exactly at one. But there is indeed a risk of prostate cancer in relatively healthy men uh, to the tune of 1.6 per thousand person years of use, which although small is still finite. Second problem is it helps as long as it is used. Beyond 96 weeks, once it was stopped, there was a rebound of ALT back to the original value. However, even in the long term, uh, use of vitamin E, no adverse event signal was noted, but uh, the authors feel that the sample size was very small to uh, observe a smaller side effect. So to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, vitamin E acting as an antioxidant targets one of the major pathophysiological mechanisms of NASH. It significantly improves ALT and histology as long as it is given both in diabetics as well as non-diabetic NASH, but it has no effect on improvement in fibrosis as of two years of use. Long-term real-life data among NASH patients with or without diabetes, even in those who have cirrhosis, suggests reduction in all-cause mortality, reduction in risk of decompensation, and improvement in transplant-free survival. Mind you, in this particular study, they did not show any improvement in liver cancer or any reduction in liver cancer. But it still needs validation in prospective RCTs if possible. The risk of increased all-cause mortality with vitamin E supplementation has not been supported by latest large meta-analysis, but the risk of prostate cancer, albeit very small, with long-term use of vitamin E still remains, and this should be kept in mind. Thank you for a patient here. Thank you, Paul. Well, you have given us all data. There are a lot of questions to, uh, and the gap um, to be answered. Uh, not very happy situation with vitamin E. Uh, let us discuss the other molecules, see whether we can do a better. And handing over to Professor Singh. Professor Singh. Professor Singh, please. Professor Singh. What happened? Professor S.P. Singh, it's your turn to introduce uh, Professor Ajay Duseja. Professor Singh. Maybe Kaur, you could take over. <laughs> yeah, in the interest of time, Dr. Acharya, can you just introduce Dr. Duseja so that we go ahead? Dr. Duseja is another one of the finest young hepatologist the nation has ever produced. He is the professor of hepatology at PGI Chandigarh and one of the leading worker in fatty liver disease in this country, which is who is going to inaugurate the ICANN-D website and uh, Pry now has collected more than 10,000 patients of fatty liver disease data from all around the country and probably has the largest experience in this country. And he is going to speak to us on this PPR, right, agonist, right, which is in this country has become very popular after the phase two trial. And he is going to tell us how exactly it works and does it actually benefit in histological improvement. Of course, we know that long-term data is not available till now.
but we hope that soon the long term data will be available professor duseja please uh, thank you sir for those uh, kind words and uh, my job is to uh, take you through the saroglitaz r as one of the pharmacological agent for treating nash Uh, at the outset, my sincere thanks to Hope Initiative and Professor Chaudhary for making me part of this uh, webinar. And we must understand the audience must understand that though we're talking of pharmacotherapy today, but then we need to understand that fatty liver disease is a lifestyle disease, and uh, uh, whether you use pharmacotherapy or not, I think the Uh, we need to control or take care of all the you know the lifestyle risk factors whatever the patient has whether overweight obesity and the other things so if the pharmacotherapy be, is being used that would be in addition to your lifestyle modifications and only a subset of patients uh, with fatty liver disease actually may require pharmacotherapy and uh, many would require only lifestyle modifications now coming to the pharmacotherapy again and i think uh, for the simplicity what i have done is i think when we, when we talk about drugs of usage in patients with fatty liver disease i think one of the drugs which are you know recommended by certain scientific societies based on certain data and that is true for vitamin e and uh, you just heard uh, kaushal speaking about that then there are certain drugs which are available they have been tested in uh, nash and they were found to be effective but still not approved by any regulatory agencies or even by the societies and in that context i think we will hear more about uh, the obitacolic acid from the next speaker so my job is to talk about a drug which has been approved by a regulatory agency in india and the drug is uh, saroglitazar which is a dual ppar alpha and a gamma agonist mm -hmm. so when we talk about you know the ppars as i said saroglitazar is a dual ppar uh, gamma and alpha agonist uh, the prototype for ppar alpha we know are the fibrates or the glofibrate was the drug which was tested tested in fatty liver disease and for ppar gamma we know uh, it is the thiazolidium drugs like the pavlitazone and we know the problems uh, with the fibrates and the pavlitazone and that is how now the dual you know ppar agonist came into being and alafibranol story also we know which was a ppar alpha and a delta agonist uh, and saroglitazar as i said is a ppar alpha and a gamma and which is uh, uh, affecting the or which is acting on the kind of root cause of fatty liver disease which means we know there's a problem with the energy homeostasis in uh, fatty liver disease there's problem with the glucose and the lipid metabolism so that is where the saroglitazar is acting and trying to control the uh, root cause so what um, how and where it acts uh, the uh, saroglitazar as is as we know that the ppar are the group of nuclear receptors and they act as what we call the transcription factors so whenever you know these pipas uh, they they are ligands which are synthetic like the drugs we are talking or natural you know ligands they act on these pipa receptors they uh, kind of you know uh, activate a certain you know target genes um and uh, uh, thereby acting as as i said the transcription factors and by the activation of these target genes you know the mrna and the various proteins are produced which you know if it is stimulating the ppar alpha would help in the beta uh, the fatty acid oxidation uh, and if it is the ppar gamma then the improvement in insulin sensitivity and various other you know uh, actions would be you know activated so this is how the saroglitazar is acting uh, at ppar alpha and gamma but it's predominantly has a ppar alpha activity and very optimal ppar gamma activity so that's why we don't see the side effects which are usually seen with ppar gamma agonist number 1 secondly the the it is also different from other glitazars in the sense that it doesn't it has a different uh, apparel moiety ring which is absent in other glitazars and it doesn't have the the glitazone ring which is you know so uh, uh, commonly which is seen in the ppar gamma agonist so that it lacks the you know the side effects of the ppar gamma agonist so this is as i said a different uh, glitazar and it basically acts 
helps to improve the insulin sensitivity, uh, also uh, improves uh, the inflammation part by acting, uh, acting on the Kaffir cells, uh, also improves the uh, fibrosis by acting on the stellate cells, also reduces the inflammation by acting or uh, reducing the endoplasmic uh, uh, stress and also improves the beta oxidation. So I think by acting at various levels, as I said, it improves overall the hepatic steatosis by, as I said, improving the insulin sensitivity and also decreasing the de novo lipogenesis. It also improves the hepatic inflammation by reducing, as I said, the ER stress. And it also improves, as I said, through the Kaffir cells by reducing the inflammatory cytokine production, it reduces the inflammation. Further, by decreasing the VLDL secretion, uh, it, it you know improves the you know the fat uh, redistribution throughout the body, and through the uh, as I said through the um, uh, the stellate cells and various other fibroblast factors, it does improve the hepatic fibrosis. So we know that I mean, the hepatic steatosis, inflammation, fibrosis, and insulin resistance. This is being tackled by uh, Saraglitazar. So that is why I think this is probably regulating what we call the root cause of uh, fatty liver uh, disease. Uh, now, what is the data which is available about its efficacy in fatty liver disease? I think uh, this is uh, one of the animal data or the preclinical data where it was shown to be uh, 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 shown to be improving steatosis, inflammation, and fibrosis in comparison to phenofibrate and the pioglitazone. Other than the animal data, there's a large amount of uh, clinical data which is available, and this is the real-world data which is available in close to around 6,000 patients where the uh, seroglitazar was shown to improve not only the liver enzymes, but also the hepatic steatosis as seen by the fibroscan. And also, it was shown to improve the serum biochemistry, that is the ALT levels, and uh, the lipid profile, which means the cholesterol, triglyceride, LDL, everything was shown to improve in this real-life data available in around uh, 6,000 patients. Other than the real-life data, I think we do have uh, the studies, the phase two study, which was presented last year in uh, ASLD, which is known as the Evidences uh, 4 study. Uh, and the design of this study was that this was a phase two study uh, of around 106 patients and four groups uh, of almost 25 patients each in placebo, one milligram, 2 milligram and 4 milligram seroglitazar. And if you look at the results in the 4 milligram versus placebo, the sorrow was found to be better uh, than placebo in causing the absolute change in the liver fat, which was assessed by the MRPDFF and also by improving the ALT levels and the percentage of patients, those who showed ALT improvement and the percentage of patients who showed the reduction in liver fat was much higher in the SARO group, mainly the 4MG SARO group in comparison to the placebo. Uh, other than that, I think uh, then the, the finally it is the histology based study which was completed uh, in India uh, last year and this is known as the evidences uh, two study. Uh, this is a multi center study which in, involved again 102 patients of 10 centers you know across the country and the entry point in this study was a biopsy proven patients with NASH with fibrosis of F1 to F3 and a nephrol activity score of four or more and uh, there was a score of at least uh, one component from each of these uh, scores, that is steatosis and lobular inflammation and hepatocyte ballooning. And the patients were randomized into two is to one into sorrow and the placebo group. And the results at the end of one year or 52 weeks showed that the number of patients who showed decrease in the NAS activity by two or more and which was spread over uh, two or, or more uh, NAS components was much higher in the seroglitazar group, which is around 52% in comparison to the placebo, which was in 20s, without worsening of fibrosis. So this was the uh, study based on which uh, uh, the data, the drug was finally approved uh, for usage in patients with NASH of F1 to F3 fibrosis in India. 
in addition to the primary endpoint, which was the improvement in the NAS score without worsening of fibrosis, there were various secondary endpoints in this study. And if you look at the individual improvement in steatosis and hepatocyte ballooning and the percent change from the baseline, it was uh, um, significantly higher in the uh, SARO group uh, in comparison to the placebo. And if you look at the various other um, uh, secondary endpoints, especially the improvement in ALT, AST, and other um, uh, lipid uh, markers, the triglyceride, LDL, I think this was again uh, the change from the baseline was much higher in the sero group in comparison uh, to the placebo. So based on this, as I said, I think the drug was finally approved for usage in patients with DASH uh, uh, with F1 to uh, F3 fibrosis. So um, and the other good point about Saraglitazar is about that it's a very safe drug uh, and the, the, uh, we have data about the usage of Saraglitazar in patients with diabetic dyslipidemia also for almost 8 to 10 years now uh, and, uh, and that was the indication where it was approved first and even in this uh, study, the histology based study, if you look at the side effects I think of Saraglitazar, they were very minor, predominantly GI side effects of flatulent dyspepsia and all and there was no dropouts because of the side effects so that way I think it's a very uh, safe drug. So, um, so, ladies and gentlemen, so I would summarize by saying that I think uh, what, when we talk about seroglitazar as a pharmacotherapic uh, agent in patients with NASH, I would say that it really targets the so-called the root cause in NASH, uh, where I said that it targets the insulin um, resistance, uh, improves the hepatic steatosis, inflammation, though the uh, histology data has not shown uh, given us the figures on the improvement in fibrosis. Uh, so we do have um, animal data, we have real life data, and we have phase two data and the histology data, which all supports the usage of seroglitazar in patients with uh, NASH. Uh, and based on all this data, as I said, this is the first drug which has been approved by any regulatory authority for NASH, and we know this is now available in India for, as I said, F1 to F3 fibrosis uh, with NASH. And this has been tried and tested in patients with diabetic dyslipidemia, as I said, for almost eight to 10 years now. And we know this is a very safe drug, no major side effects. And again, if you look at the cost, I think a tablet of Cerebrotazar will cost around 32 rupees, which is you know less than half a dollar uh, cost of a per pill. Uh, the only uh, um, uh, cons about the cerebrators are, I mean, if you ask me, would be that the data, whatever histology data we have till date has not been uh, peer reviewed or has not really been published as a full paper. We are waiting for that to happen. And as I said, there was no mention about the fibrosis improvement uh, in this particular histology study. And the drug is uh, approved or available only in India for the time being, and it's not uh, universally available. So with that, I think thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Juseja. And uh, now the uh, next uh, topic is a little bit of a link. And I will hand it over to Dr. Konar to introduce the speaker and the subject. Professor Dr. Konar, please. Uh, good evening. I think now we are heading into the uh, the real issue today, that is the role of obeticolic acid in the management of NASH since the publication of link trial and regenerate <clears throat> trial. Everybody is hopeful that this is going to address the final common pathway that is hepatic fibrosis and uh, to discuss its role currently in the management of NASH. Uh, uh, we are having a very young and brilliant Hepatologist from Delhi, Dr. Mano Guadan, who is currently at the BLK Hospital in Delhi, to tell us all about the role of uh, obeticolic acid in the management of NASH. Over to Mano. Uh, thank you, sir. Just give me a minute while I load my slides. Okay. Uh, can you see my slides, sir? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for asking me to talk about this molecule. Uh, I've been asked to talk about the beta folic acid, which is recently introduced in India. So, most of us hardly have any experience. It's been a month or one and a half months of usage. So, what I'm going to do today is present an index case 
where the patient is worthy of using obitacolic acid try to make a case there give you data about uh, the success or the advantage of oka but what i'll do is i'll critically analyze the adverse effect data i've been asked to specifically mention and discuss the hurdles in the dash to nash and that's what i'll do uh, manav to be very frank and Sir. to put the record straight uh, i had no mischief in mind when i had given you this topic <laughs> you know the <laughs> the developments occurred after that but then i thought that you know with your wit and your balance you'll be able to deliver a very balanced kind of a talk on this topic it's it's a, i understand a very ticklish topic thank you so yeah, much I, for taking on the challenge yeah i i'll try to do my best sir so uh, i i have no judgment to make here because i've hardly used the drug i'm only analyzing the data and i'm going to share that uh, analysis with you guys so uh, dr duseja very beautifully talked about the nuclear receptors and how pipa acts at the nuclear level to improve steatosis inflammation and maybe fibrosis we still need data on that similarly fxr or fast acting x receptor is a nuclear receptor the natural ligand is bile acid so your cdc a keno deoxy folic acid folic acid they uh, bind to fxr and activate the pathway which helps in resolution of nash like pipa regulates like seroglitazor it improves insulin sensitivity that means fxr activation improves insulin sensitivity and lipid metabolism it also increases beta oxidation of fatty acids thus getting rid of the fat in the liver it also controls bile acid formation so basically it inhibits your cypa7 enzyme which leads to formation of bile acid so overall bile acid formation is decreased by this molecule with that background let's go on to the case straight away so this is a patient who's on my follow for almost more than a year now 50 year old male bmi of 29 he's a diabetic on medication for diabetes diabetes was not very well controlled but he did not have any hypertension or dyslipidemia on a routine health check one year back he was detected to have alt of 65 with a fatty liver and ultrasound and all other etiologies were ruled out by blood investigation i did a liver biopsy we routinely try to do biopsies in all the patients who we suspect nash if they agree to it many of them them don't agree to it that's a different thing and we found out that he has nash with f2 fibrosis and his fibrosis can value at that time that is around 1 uh, 1 year and 2 months back was 10 kg uh vitamin e was the only approved drug at that time we started him on vitamin e at 8 and iu per uh, per mg per day sorry this i have this Well, I'm sorry for this mistake. 800 IU per day, and I added the SGLT2 inhibitor also to control his sugar. Then his sugars were controlled reasonably. Just in addition to whatever he was taking, I added a canalic glucose. One month back, that is after one year of completing good sugar control and vitamin E, his ALT was ranging at in the range of 55, and fibroscan had actually worsened. We didn't do a biopsy. Repeat biopsies usually we don't do. Uh, fibrosis scan was 12.4 kilo pascal, and that tells us that this is a patient who is not responding to your first line vitamin E therapy. The options we have are we can use seroglitazar, but Dr. Dushar told you that the data on improvement of fibrosis with seroglitazar is still awaited. So I'm hoping that we get that data soon. The other drug which we have now is Oka, and let's see what the trials tell us about obitacolic acid. the first trial published we are all aware of this i'll just uh, talk about this in passing this was phase 2 trial called flint trial uh, 140 patients in oka 25 mg per day arm versus placebo and another 142 patients and the treatment was given for 72 weeks the patients recruited were non cirrhotic non alcoholic steatohepatitis hepatitis which are biopsy proven and they looked at liver histology specifically nephrol activity score and fibrosis Uh, in the oka 25 mg arm um, 45% of patients had improvement in histology mind you of this 45% 35% actually improved their fibrosis the placebo arm improvement was 23% and 19% improvement in fibrosis so your regular things also work your diet your exercise also works so 19% of patients did have a improvement in fibrosis even in placebo versus 35% fibrosis improvement in the oka arm and that brought us to the phase 3 trial which is the focus of the day as dr konar said the focus of the day today is the phase 3 data which has been recently been available now this is the trial which targets to enroll 2400 patients and they they are being randomized in one is to one is to one in placebo versus oka 10 mg versus oka 25 mg uh the thing to note here is here the two sided alpha error is 0.01 that means if the 
the trial arm versus the placebo arm achieves a p value less than 0.01 only then it will be considered significant so it is not 0.05 which we routinely take for our other intervention trials there are two interim points here one is a liver biopsy at the 18 months the second liver biopsy will be done at 48 months and finally at the end of uh, end of study now end of study is not defined it is basically driven by a clinical uh, end points so what we are presenting now is a phase 3 data on month 18 interim analysis of liver biopsy and other investigation the two primary end points we are looking at here is fibrosis improvement by more than one stage with no worsening of nash and the other primary end point is nash resolution with no worsening of fibrosis by nash resolution we mean either there is no fatty liver on follow up or there is fatty liver with no steato hepatitis and the fibrosis should not worsen so these are two primary end points we are looking at the first primary end point that means fibrosis improvement by at least one stage with no worsening of nash was seen in 23% of patients in uh, oka 25 mg arm versus 11% in the placebo arm the 10 mg arm also showed some improvement but the p value did not reach the pre determined significance that is p value was 0.04 we are looking at a p value less than 0.01 here so 25 mg oka achieved a significant improvement in fibrosis at 18 months interim interval if you look at the second primary end point that is nash resolution with no worsening of fibrosis it is numerically more 12% versus 8% in the placebo arm but has not reached the pre specified significance uh, the aclt levels did improve as we had seen in all the drugs which we have tried in pioglitazone in vitamin e in seroglitazone the alt asc improved and they continue to be in the good range while the patient is on medications at 18 months Uh, let me give you data which was uh, uh, presented by Professor Sanyal in this ASLD in November 2019. This is the further uh, analysis data of the region rate study. We had some 900 out patients in the interim analysis which was published in 2019. This expanded secondary analysis talks about 1,218 patients. That means 300 patients more than the previously published data. Similar results in the primary endpoint one, that is fibrosis improvement, is significantly more in OCA arms. but look at the second primary end point nash resolution with no worsening of fibrosis was seen in 14.9% of patient versus 7.9 and this is significant so that means probably the previous data where it was not significant was due to a type 2 error so as you keep on increasing the follow up and increasing the number of patients the second end point of nash resolution also turns out to be significant so that so we know that this is a drug which is reversing fibrosis so there is a problem the problem is in the adverse effect profile let's quickly see what we are looking at if you look at the adverse effects touted in the uh, nac trial the region rate study which was published in lancet the most common adverse effect is pruritus seen in a whopping 51% of patients who were given 25 mg oka although only 5% had a severe intense pruritus which needed dose adjustment or uh, stoppage of medication but many of these patients did require antihistaminics and it is significant so that raises first question what is happening why are we having pruritus in a drug which is improving liver now i if i have to ask question i will say is it affecting the bile acid level in the blood we understand that uh, oka acts on both ost receptors as well as bcep bcep will take uh, which will excrete the bile acid from the hepatocyte into canal canaliculi on the other hand the ost receptor will excrete the bile acid from the hepatocyte into sinusoid so are we actually raising the bile acid level in these patients we don't know the, none of this data is available i like to be uh, enlightened on this if we have any data by any of our speakers second thing was which was slightly more disturbing but again easily controllable is the effect on blood cholesterol the ldl cholesterol increased in 7% of patients on placebo versus 17% in oka arm 25 mg but look at the quantum of increase at the end of one month of treatment in the 25 mg oka arm the ldl increased by 23 mg per deciliter that means somebody who has a ldl value of 150 at the end of one month after treatment has a ldl value of 173 and that's a big increase compare that with placebo there is no change actually that also shows in the use of statins in these patients the number of patients who needed statins in the oka 25 mg arm was 53 as compared to 17 patients in placebo so more and more patients are requiring statin to control their uh, cholesterol the good thing is once you start them on statin 
the LDL reverses to below the baseline at month 6 and month 18. Also, they did not notice any adverse uh, cardiovascular effects in the groups. But let me again remind you, this is 18 months and same data. We still don't know what is going to happen to these patients once we increase the follow-up. The third problem, we are tinkering here with bile acids inside the, the bile also and inside the hepatocyte also. So there are likely to be some effects on the gallstone formation. And that's what was seen. If you look at gallstone rated adverse events, now, this is not statistically significant, but 19 patients, that is 3% in the OCA 25 milligram arm developed gallstone related adverse events versus only two patients in the placebo group. The risk of pancreatitis was not much different. Uh, three in the OCA 25 milligram versus one, both are less than 1%. Even the gallstone related adverse events were not significant, but numerically much more. Again, I can ask, I can uh, debate this may be a type 2 statistical error as you increase the number of patients it may become significant, but you don't know. You need to see further in the follow-up. Finally, liver-related adverse effects. Now, this is a drug which is supposed to improve the liver. Six hepatic serious adverse events were noted in OCA 25 milligram, that is 1% of patients, versus two in the placebo group. Now, the good part again here is the expert reviewers did not identify any consistent pattern of liver injury. All cases were associated with confounding concomitant medications or some other illness. So that's what we are looking at. But what I would say is we still need more data to establish the safety. Efficacy we know, it, it reverses fibrosis, but we have to be more, uh, more careful about the safety of this drug in a time to come. Let me remind you of this black box warning. This is not for Nash cirrhosis, this is for PBC cirrhosis, but I think this will apply to Nash cirrhosis also. So as of now, this drug is not to be used in cirrhotic patients till the time we have data about uh, of reverse trial, which is uh, coming out, which may be coming out, I think, towards the end of this year. So any child B, child C patients should not be given OCA at the regular doses. You start with 5 milligrams per week. But again, as of now, I would say don't use them in cirrhotic. Let's go back to the clinical case. Last two slides here. So we understand that when we use this drug, it is an off-label use. So I took informed consent from the patient and uh, started him on OCA 25 milligram per day. This was around a month back. The drug had recently come. The patient developed severe itching in 10 days. I added antihistaminic. There was minor improvement, but the patient was complaining too much. I decreased the dose to 10 milligram. I don't know whether that's the right thing to do, but that's what I did. And uh, ALT at three weeks after treatment was 45. Again, that's not normal, but we still need more data on that. Uh, to summarize, my dear friends, OCA is a drug which is reasonably good for NASH. It has shown to have good efficacy in improvement of fibrosis. Data on long-term safety are awaited, but with the recent FDA rejection, or should I say postponement of the approval, the fate of this drug hangs in balance. I thank you for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Manav. Uh, we have our very excellent uh, uh, review of the data, which is available. Uh, we are back to Professor Sanya. Uh, Professor Sanya uh, has already been introduced, and he will. We have looked at uh, vitamin E. We have looked at uh, saroglitazar, and we have looked at uh, obeticolic acid. Now, Professor Sanya will take us further to see what is the full horizon of medications that will be available in 2000 and forward. Over to Professor Sanya. Thank you, Abraham. Uh, so, you know, I think this is a common thing that you've heard all morning or all evening in India, that uh, NASH does not occur uh, in a vacuum. Uh, it is part of a multi-system disorder where patients frequently have uh, concurrent cardiometabolic uh, disease, uh, diastolic dysfunction, pancreatic beta cell dysfunction, uh, and chronic kidney disease. At the root cause of all of this is metabolic stress with systemic inflammation and a pro-fibrogenic cytokine milieu. And this is driven in turn by diet-induced excess adiposity. So if you really want to treat the root cause, you need to treat the underlying adiposity. And the cause of this adiposity, of course, is excess caloric consumption uh, with respect to what a person spends. So if you're in imbalance between the number of calories that you take in 
and the number of calories that you burn. The body has to figure out what to do with the excess calories. And the most efficient way of storing excess energy is in the form of fat. And so it doesn't really matter what kind of diet you go on. If in the end of the day, you take more calories than you burn, the excess calories have to be stored uh, as fat. And as you can see over here, India is in green. Uh, so we're talking about the average uh, caloric intake is about 25 to 2600 calories uh, daily. Also, there is something, I'm not going to show you the data, but there is also sort of a global laziness indicator. And Indians actually, unfortunately, uh, come out uh, on that uh, as uh, one of the countries that are most sedentary. So unless you're in the villages uh, and, you know, or you're, you are forced by your economic circumstances to really walk or ride a bicycle or do physical activity, uh, the natural tendency is for a lot of people not to exercise. The second challenge is that weight loss is tough to maintain. So this is a summary of a lot of different studies, but what you see in the uh, brown bars is the initial weight loss, uh, but then over in the blue bars, you see the proportion of people who can maintain the weight loss. And you can see that the degree of weight loss decreases almost universally. And it's only a minority of people who can sustain weight loss. And that's typically in the 10% range if you just do garden variety lifestyle intervention. And there are many reasons for this. But if, right now, because of this failure of weight loss, it, it is still the cornerstone. You still have to do it. But it's really important to remember that when the rest of the family is not changing how they live and what they eat, it is very hard for one person to change their diet. So if you, when you do have these conversations about lifestyle, it is very important to engage the whole family. And the benefits of weight loss, of course, are related to the key outcomes that are associated with excess adiposity as summarized in this slide. Uh, you can see that, uh, you know, Bev, your excess adiposity has been linked to increasing circulating volume, atrial dysrhythmias, obstructive sleep apnea, hyperleptinemia, insulin resistance, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, hypertension, dyslipidemia, et cetera. And uh, so many of these actually have been shown to actually get better after post-bariatric surgery. But bariatric surgery is not a panacea. It is not a magic solution to the problem. It is a viable option for some patients. What you see on the left is a meta-analysis that was published a couple of years ago now, but with lots of patients with up to five years of follow-up, showing that you have a decrease in cardiovascular events and coronary events. Um, although there's a decrease in cerebrovascular events, this was not statistically significant. On the right is a summary of uh, published studies uh, of biopsies uh, post-bariatric surgery, where again, you can see a lot of people do improve. A fibrosis improvement is not as prominent as in markers of uh, disease activity. And actually 12% of people had worsening fibrosis. And the recent studies from France have shown that up to 40% of people who have advanced fibrosis, actually half those patients will not improve their fibrosis. And the overall quality of the data in the bariatric literature is not very good. Furthermore, there is an emerging theme of increased suicide risk after bariatric surgery. This is a systematic analysis uh, review, and you can see pretty much all of the data points are to the right of the zero line uh, and overall, there is an increase in suicide risk. And this is linked to the addiction circuitry in the brain uh, and its linkage to uh, depression. And a lot of people eat excessively uh, to cope with severe psychological stress. And uh, we really don't have very high quality data on all of this. Uh, but when you take away their ability and their coping mechanism without offering them an alternate, uh, it can make depression much worse. 
we're already in the U.S. seeing a very significant and dramatic rise in alcoholism uh, after bariatric surgery, particularly in women. And so these are things that we need to be cognizant of and be, and so that the decision to move towards bariatric surgery should be made taking into consideration all of the psychopathology that may be present in an individual patient and to make sure that the safety is not compromised because the first principle of medicine is to do no harm. So then moving on to drug therapy, uh, you know, once again, because this disease occurs in a systemic milieu of insulin resistance, inflammation, and fibrosis, which occurs across multiple end organs, there is a lot of interest in finding common biology that connects all of these different serious end organ diseases that actually are concomitant threats to life. And so it's important to think about managing the systemic milieu in which NASH develops. Once again, I bring you back to this core concept of NASH as a part of a multi-system disorder. And what I've shown over here are the type of agents that have been shown to improve cardiovascular disease, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, uh, type two diabetes, and chronic kidney disease. And uh, where we st and I'll briefly review with you where we stand with respect to their liver-related benefits. So first thing I want to make this is a very practical point that if you look at drugs that are used for the treatment of di uh, diabetes, insulin is right up there, right after metformin. It is very very common to use insulin. This is a global pattern, and I am sure Indian data are not that different. But what happens is when you the use insulin is that you gain weight. And it's dose dependent, as you can see on the right. On the left, again, you see as a, as a time course, and you can see that you're continuing to gain up to three years that in the, these data sets, that you're still gaining weight. So insulin makes you gain more adipose tissue because insulin is a lipogenic uh, hormone. And so it can make your adiposity worse. This is particularly a problem for your patient with advanced fibrosis. And especially if you are thinking about transplant uh, down the road uh, for a patient with uh, NASH cirrhosis, where we're trying to say you have to reduce your weight and you have to get your A1C under better control. It is very common for transplant hepatologists to tell their patients that you, know, you have to prove that you're compliant by getting your A1C down and you have to get your weight down. And so the patient panics and runs to their, uh, their uh, diabetologist to say that well, I need to get my blood sugar down. And the diabetologist says, oh, I know how to do that. I'll give you more insulin. So they get their blood sugar down, but then their weight goes up. And then, you know, they're again considered to be bad risk for transplant. And so the patient then starts thinking that, if I don't lose weight, I am not going to get transplant, I'm going to die. So frequently they will then start starving themselves and going on really you know, unbalanced diets. And when that happens, your sarcopenia worsens and you decompensate. And we've seen this, this actually was first seen in the simtuzumab trials that we did where the cirrhotic patients, you could actually identify who was going to have clinical decompensation because they lost weight in the six weeks prior to that. And nobody initially could figure out, you know, it's a, what, that why would weight loss actually cause decompensation because we always say weight loss is a good thing. But when you say weight loss, all weight loss is not the same. Weight loss is good when you lose adipose tissue, but retain your muscle mass, your bone mass, and you become metabolically more healthy. But when you, uh, lose weight because you're losing muscle without actually moving your fat, then that's not a good way to lose weight. So this is a very practical point in how you use uh, uh, and control drugs for diabetes and control their sugars. And it is very important to remind our diabetes colleagues that, you know, maybe use some of these other agents and then use insulin as sparingly as possible in this population. 
The second point to make is that GLP-1 agonists have now been shown to reduce all-cause mortality, hospitalization for heart failure, and improve kidney status, as again shown over here in this systematic trial, uh, uh, in the systematic review. Uh, so these are key endpoints for our type 2 diabetes population. And many of our patients, at least 50% of the NASH patients that you will see, will have type 2 diabetes, and particularly those who are most in need of treatment, that is those who have a more significant, clinically significant fibrosis, are more likely to have type 2 diabetes. So semaglutide, uh, had, there's an initial study, a small study with liraglutide that was positive, but it had only 23 patients in each arm. A much bigger study with semaglutide has just been read out. We'll see the final results at ASF. But in this study with over 300 patients, there was almost a 60% resolution of steatohepatitis. And there was a trend for improvement in fibrosis, but it did not reach significance. So we'll have to see the data in detail to be able to fully talk about it. Similarly, SGLT2 inhibitors as a class have been shown to improve multiple outcomes of interest in type 2 diabetes. And over here, the data for the major trials, which is the uh, TIMI, Canvas, Empareg, uh, and Credence are shown, where you can see the data for heart failure, heart failure or other cardiovascular death and MACE are actually shown. And you can see that uh, SGLT2s as a class uh, tend to improve all of these critical outcomes. Now, how well they work in liver, the drug development is much earlier in, in its life cycle. And most of the data are with uh, non-invasive tools showing a modest improvement in steatosis and LFTs. Now, one of the key things to remember is that it will make no difference if you fix the liver and the patient dies of a heart attack. And so there are some concepts about treatment of dyslipidemia that we as hepatologists must be aware of. So under normal circumstances, when your liver makes a small amount of triglyceride, you make small VLDL particles. And the, when these VLDL particles are circulating, peripheral lipoprotein lipase can completely hydrolyze the triglyceride and suck the triglyceride out of the VLDL resulting in a intermediate density lipoprotein IDL, which has cholesterol in it, which then gets acted on by lipoprotein lipase and the residual particle is called an LDL particle. And these LDL particles are of a certain size and based on their size, they're considered large LDL particles. Now imagine you have fatty liver disease and you're making a lot of triglyceride in your liver. So more of this triglyceride actually finds its way out of the liver in the form of the larger VLDL particles. And as these particles circulate, the lipoprotein lipase is no longer able to completely hydrolyze it. So the intermediate density lipoprotein contains more triglyceride than it should have. And these are sensitive to hepatic lipases as they circulate through the liver and now in the endothelium which then cleave these intermediate density lipoprotein particles into multiple small LDL particles. So for the same degree of cholesterol, you will have multiple small particles, which can penetrate the endothelium more easily, have more surface area, get oxidized more easily, and produce more endothelial dysfunction, and are more easily taken up in macrophages and incite a greater inflammatory response. So, this is typical of the atherogenic dyslipidemia that we see in NASH. So we obviously have to treat with statins, but statins do not impact LDL particle size. And physical activity is essential to improve atherogenic dyslipidemia, particularly the small dense LDL particle fraction. Now, nicotinic acid is the other agent that has been shown to improve LDL particle size, but for a variety of reasons, its practice that the use of nicotinic acid has markedly decreased in the routine clinical practice. Now, in this setting, here comes saroglitazar. So saroglitazar, you've already heard about, so I'm not going to go through the details of how it works, but here are data from three sets of uh, studies from the US, from India, and from Mexico. And in each, you'll see the delta, which is the decrease in uh, LDL cholesterol, 
across the three studies compared to placebo, and these are significant uh, across the different studies. So in uh, saroglitazar, four milligram reduced LDL by 7.2% in India. So when you look at the atherogenic risk profile, and if you need additional drugs to bring the LDL down, uh, this is a good option on top of that. And of course, this is a summary of a lot of the uh, data that has already been uh, accumulated with saroglitazar in diabetes. Uh, there are 18 selected studies with five manuscripts and a lot of abstracts with over almost 6,000 patients. And what you see over here on the left is the uh, sets of bars from different studies, but basically showing uh, an improvement in A1C, an improvement in ALT in the middle panel, and an improvement and without really any significant impact on body weight, which is obviously a concern anytime you have PPAR gammas. Now, moving on to more liver targeted approaches. So, you have to think about background therapeutics because what you're trying to do is improve all of the end organs at the same time before you then say, okay, now on top of having treated this background disease, if that is insufficient, then I need something more specific for the liver. So in which patients? So typically, once again, we come back over here. So the people we're talking about are people who have more advanced liver disease, typically patients with clinically significant fibrosis stage two and three. It would be fantastic if we had a drug for NASH cirrhosis. We don't have that yet. So we'll focus on clinically significant fibrosis for now. For the cirrhotic population, for what it's worth, the vitamin A data probably looks the best so far in terms of overall safety, efficacy data, and actually whether even with being retrospective, at least it shows a dramatic reduction in mortality. Uh, so for the cirrhotic population, that is what I personally use. I'm happy to talk about it also. And in selected cases with pyoglitazone. Now, if, our, if you think once again about NASH as a multi-system disorder, then the ideal drug should be one that not only improves liver, but also improves all of these other uh, cardiometabolic and extrahepatic outcomes that are shown in this text box over here. So if you, you keep those in mind and let's review sort of where we sit with these different uh, classes of molecules. We've heard about TZDs, many beneficial effects uh, on histology, uh, but glycemic control is improved. It is neutral with respect to MACE. We don't have a lot of data with GFR. Interestingly, it can actually cause your LDL cholesterol to go up a little bit and it can cause weight gain. FXRs, we've already heard extensively, not going to talk much more about it. Uh, FGF21 is another class, it is another cytokine, which is adipokine and hepatokine, has pleiotropic effects, causes weight loss, very nice improvement in atherogenic profile, but we don't have data on cardiovascular clinical outcomes, and we certainly don't have data on liver histology. The Falcon trials will provide this to us, next year. The thyroxine beta receptor, again, very good uh, lipid uh, profile. Um, it does improve NASH and has some weak fibrosis improvement. Uh, and phase three trials are currently ongoing, as we discussed before. It is neutral with respect to glycemic control in, uh, and in terms of changes in weight. And then the, you have uh, additional uh, classes over here, uh, uh, which, uh, let me see if I can move my, this over, GLP once over here, I'm just moving my, so I can see this over here, and we've already talked about the GLP once, and SGLT2s are too early in development to be really considered frontline NASH therapeutics, but the nice thing about GLPs causes weight loss, is really neutral with respect to atherogenic risk profile, uh, but it improves MACE, improves GFR, and uh, overall glycemic control is improved. And certainly now there's data that it improves NASH histology as well. You already seen the data with OCA. This is the approved drugs in India, in the US. 
the FDA has provided a complete response letter saying, please continue the trial. But right now, the benefit risk profile uh, does not allow for a rapid accelerated approval. And so there's no question that the efficacy side is very clear, that there is an improvement in fibrosis. The issue, as was very nicely pointed out, is about safety. So OCA in general, let me move this over here. Uh, uh, majority of AEs are consistent with the mechanism of action in PBC and NASH. Pruritus and LDL cholesterol are, uh, are issues, but they are manageable in the majority of cases. And hepatic safety is an issue, but can be, again, managed with patient selection and appropriate monitoring. And gallbladder disease is something we have to track closely. There's a numerical imbalance, was not statistically significant, but you know, these trials are not designed to provide statistical significance for side effects. No trial is designed for that. So you have to pay very close attention to these imbalances uh, in the context of uh, these clinical trials and track these in real world settings. So personally, for me, the decision pathway, you have to have stable cardiovascular status, you know, because of the LDL and other issues until we have large amount of data uh, you know, uh, it, it, you always want to make sure that from a cardiovascular point of view, you, you're not taking someone who had an MI within the last six months or has unstable angina or just got a stent put in and put them on a drug that increases LDL cholesterol. Number two, uh, we already heard about this, best to avoid in cirrhosis until more safety data is available. Pay attention to the LDL cholesterol. If you do put someone on OCA, you got to check there, make sure you put them on statins, you bring them to bring their cholesterol to the optimal range, and then you monitor the patient. And any rice can be used by intensification of uh, statin therapy or going to highly, uh, uh, you know, the high intensity statin treatment. And those guidelines are very well established in the cardiovascular literature. And ask about the patient for baseline pruritus. We don't think of NASH as a pruritogenic disease. But when you actually do the questionnaires, one out of five patients has baseline pruritus. Now, one of the things that has emerged in these cases of, uh, you know, where we're worried about Delhi in the setting of PBC and a couple of cases in the setting of the large region rate trial is that they almost all occur in the context of an acute intercurrent illness. So until we have a better understanding of what happens when you get an acute intercurrent illness, if you develop any kind of acute illness, febrile illness, any kind of acute illness, best to stop OCA till you've had a chance to recheck LFTs and make sure there is no liver issue going on before restarting it. And, and then again, um, always, uh, you know, if somebody has symptomatic gallstones, it's best to get that taken care of before starting OCA. There's one poster showing that, uh, that was published uh, about a couple of years ago, uh, showing that uh, cholesterol saturation increases when you use OCA. So there may be biological possibility there, but I think we need more data for sure. Now, saroglitazar is rapidly generating a large body of literature to support this. This is all summarized on this slide. Uh, but as you've seen, uh, these are the data for the primary efficacy endpoint that led to approval in India, uh, and that you can see an improvement in the activity score, uh, their improvement in ballooning, uh, particularly with the four milligram dose. And then over here, you're seeing improvement in steatosis. Uh, but you know, uh, in the end, uh, you have to show reduced progression to cirrhosis. And then if you do get to cirrhosis, that you're either causing regression or you're stabilizing the cirrhosis. So I think there's still, even though the data is looking fantastic, uh, there's still work to be done with saroglitazar. But the best evidence for benefit is in people who are just beginning, who are still, you know, stage two, early stage three fibrosis, et cetera. So putting it all together, the thinking of it as a multi-system disorder, where the field is moving is that when you initially diagnose, you need to not only know what is happening in the liver, but what is happening in the kidney, heart, eyes, brain, 
all the end organs that are affected. Start with a, your lifestyle, weight loss regimen, use statins for cardiovascular risk management with fibrates if particularly triglycerides are increased because statins do not improve triglycerides. Now, if you will not use fibrates, saroglitazar is a fantastic option in this setting. And if you have patients with NASH, given that saroglitazar improves NASH and fibrates don't actually improve NASH, this may be a preferred choice in this setting. And then depending on the patient's clinical status with respect to their heart disease and their EGFR, particularly if you have any concern about that, then you need background SGLT2s and GLP-1s simply because of for their systemic disease. Until there is larger data sets on all of these systemic clinical outcomes in the context of cerebral Now, certainly, uh, you, once you've done, now because all of these treatments, whether it is saroglitazar, SGLT2, GLP-1, all of these may have beneficial effects on NASH. You want to treat for a period of time and reassess the patient at some point, and then consider whether the patient needs additional liver-targeted therapy. And specifically, the people who have F3 fibrosis, they are, I think, the tipping point where they're close to cirrhosis, yet there is the disease is still malleable. You can still move the needle. We have not been able to consistently reverse cirrhosis in a predictable manner. So F2, F3 is really your target population. F3 is probably where you have the greatest benefit to risk ratio of drug therapy. And for those who have very active F3 disease with active, where you look like you have active fibrogenesis, OCA may have an edge because of the data with fibrosis, but we need more data with saroglitazar. Whereas a little bit earlier, which is the broader pool of patients, the saroglitazar because of its metabolic benefits and dyslipidemia benefits, and benefits on NASH uh, will have an edge over OCA. Ultimately, then you have to periodically reassess the patient, at least at annual intervals, to make sure that the disease is not indeed progressing. And a simple way to do that is just look at the FIB4, uh, you know, in routine clinical practice, along with FibroScan, and uh, to make sure that your liver stiffness is not uh, progressing along with and uh, your uh, FIB4. And ultimately, the goal is to improve mortality, healthcare costs, and functionality. Thank you. Thank you, Arun, uh, for that excellent overview uh, of really telling don't treat the disease, but treat the patient. Uh, exactly. This is a systemic disorder. Treat the patient. Thank yes. you, Arun. <laughs> Over to Gaur Chaudhary. Uh, he has a small formal inauguration. Uh, oh, please okay. have all your questions ready. There will be questions and answers. Quite a few questions have come, but you know, before that we have this, uh, may I request Dr. S.P. Singh to kindly uh, take us through the inauguration on the uh, uh, platform. Dr. Singh is back with us. He had got dropped off because of a poor connection. Welcome back, Dr. Singh. Over to you. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to announce the launch of the Icon D website uh, today. After months of work, hard work, and dedication, we are delighted to officially announce the launch today. Uh, and this is the most opportune moment because we have around 1,700 people, delegates, who are locked on. And all of them are, you know, Nash or Nafal uh, uh, Bhaktar. So it's the best time. I, am I audible? Yeah, you are audible, Dr. Singh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So may I now invite uh, Ajay Duseja, the convener of Icon Day, to kindly take over the uh, launch of the website. Ajay. Uh, yeah. uh, may, may, I, may I also just uh, add in a small word? Uh, you know, this platform is uh, being jointly hosted by Hope Initiative and Indian National Association for Study of Liver. And I'm, I consider it and deem it a proud privilege that we have the luminaries and the uh, leaders of that society here with us, Dr. Kaushal, Dr. S. P. Singh, and others. Uh, yes, please, sorry for the intervention. Go ahead, Ajay. Thank you, uh, thank you sir. I think uh, 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 ICON-D is the Indian consortium on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. 
and uh, the idea of having this consortium was uh, conceived in uh, 2017 and after a year of preparation we officially took off in december 2018 so we have been you know connecting with people uh, with whatsapp groups emails and all but since over this one and a half years i think the data has grown i think uh, the number of participants have grown so we thought that we must have uh, a website of uh, this icon d and that is what we are launching today now this consortium is there for last one and a half years now and this is the consortium uh, which is being looked after by the inazal nafal task force but i must admit here that i think this um, the concept of this consortium the way the data we have collected and the way the journey we have covered would not have been possible without the mentorship of uh, professor arun sanyal who gave us of this idea of having an indian consortium because we keep having you know studies from different parts of the country but then there was a no national registry which was available in this country so that was the whole idea he actually pushed us and gave us uh, all the guidance and help and where we are today is all because of his guidance and also i'm thankful to professor s p singh who is the chairperson of the uh, nafal task force and this consortium and i think his help and guidance has been really marvelous all through this journey i'm also taking this opportunity to thank the nazar we have the nazar secretary with us today dr kaushal madan uh, and uh, the previous nazar secretary president and the office bearers and finally the zaidas um, who's the our educational partners and are who's giving us the unconditional edu national grant to carry on with this so and i'm also very thankful today to all the stalwarts who we have today professor acharya professor gordas professor koshi and professor konar i think who are all there and the other speakers who are there at this launch so what i'll do is i'll just demonstrate the before i demonstrate the launch i'll request professor sanyal and then professor sp singh to say a few words about this and then i'll show the launch Should I go first? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, congratulations, Ajay, and congratulations to Zaidas uh, for supporting this. Uh, you know, uh, there's so much data around Nash around, from around the world, but what we know is that it's a very heterogeneous disease. It's a clinical syndrome. It's not a disease like pneumococcal pneumonia. It's not a single etiology. It's a complex. metabolic disorder which has its roots in gene environmental interactions and so uh, depending on which part of the world you're from you have unique gene sets a unique diets unique lifestyle issues unique environmental exposures and how all these come together uh, to produce the disease and it, uh, it's and contribute to a progression who progresses who doesn't progress and how that will eventually impact the response to drugs uh, and various therapeutic interventions really has to be considered in a region by region in a uh, manner and you cannot translate and just automatically believe that data generated in one part of the world can just be transplanted into another and life is good so for that you need multi center registries where the common good becomes sort of the guiding mission and people can come together uh we've learned a lot through such consortia in the west and it always seemed to me that there is such incredible depth and breadth of intellect and expertise in india particularly in hepatology uh that uh this is a really an unmet need and uh, again i want to congratulate you ajay and for your consensus building uh, skills and to be anxiedus for bringing uh, people from all over the country to contribute to this database which now has over 4000 patients this is going to provide very very important data first of all you know we have submitted to asld a simple clinical uh, prognostic classification scheme where we can actually predict what will happen to the patient without having to do biopsies even without having to do fibro scans comp anything you know so we're trying to develop simple paradigms that every family practitioner can use in their office 
As soon as that becomes public, we would like to be able to see if the same thing works in India. And you already now have the data set to be able to do that. And if it works, you've immediately changed practice in India. And then I'm looking forward to a whole slew of data, looking at rural India versus urban India. India has such unique aspects that are not seen in other parts of the world uh, about the disease in uh, Nash in rural India uh, versus urban in different regions of the country, which have very diverse diets, et cetera. And so, you know, I think this is a fantastic opportunity and uh, you, you made remarkable progress and I congratulate the, the whole icon D group for this. And I look forward to working with you guys as we move towards these publications. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Maybe Professor S.P. Singh for a few words. Uh, thanks, Ajay. And it's been wonderful. We have come a long, long way from, you know, in 2017, we started uh, planning about a year. In 2018, we started in earnest collecting data. Though we are targeted about 50 uh, centers across the country, now 35 centers are actively contributing data and we have over 4,500 uh, NAFL patient data with us. So it's, uh, it's incredible and I'm sure uh, we are going to have much more data and we have data on different aspects. In addition, I think uh, Ajay is trying to uh, have other parallel studies also uh, yeah, on this platform and uh, it will be nice to see that they take off well, one of which is uh, NAFL uh, and COVID-19 uh, disease and the other one is regarding intragastric balloon dilatation, the effect in patients with NAFL. So it's been a uh, good journey. We presented our data in last year APW Kolkata. Ajay had done it and it was very well appreciated. It was very nice. And uh, I'm sure with the guidance and uh, patronage of Prof. Arun Sanya, uh, this is going to lead to a lot of meaningful uh, data being collated and a lot of good publications coming out uh, from this. Um, uh, and at the end, I must thank the Zyder Stadula people without whose uh, support this uh, would not have uh, possible. And lastly, all those people from different parts of India who have contributed to the huge uh, data already, uh, thank you guys, thank you. And this I again hand, it, uh, hand the uh, platform back to Ajay. Ajay. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. I think what I'll do now is uh, maybe show you the live uh, uh, launch of this website. So uh, let me just do it here. Is this my window of, uh, visible here? Yeah, it's visible. So www .icon. So the um, browser is www.icond.com. And uh, let me see. Let's go. So this goes live. This is the home page of the you know, the website and this is showing us the total number which have been enrolled uh, till date, which is 4406. And this is the slide changer, which is on the, again, the home screen showing the mentor, chairperson and the convener. And uh, uh, we can, this other than the home page, I think the few of the sections which we have made is the uh, introduction gives us the and the methodology which we are following in problem with you know the maybe my connection here but then the, this also you know shows us the uh, you know the participating centers uh, I'll just maybe share the participating centers here uh, and within the map I think you can see this is the participating center map and these are the 35 centers across around the 22 or 24 cities uh, across the country. Almost all parts of the you know, country are you know, part of this uh, consortium. And uh, 
the other than that i think we have a column for the core committee and finally we have a column for the member login where i think the members of this uh, consortium can log in by the username and password which will be shared to them and they can have access to the whole data and their center data and uh, we will see that whether i think they can also you know kind of submit the data here otherwise we were doing it on a different platform uh, also i will take this opportunity to you know request everyone anybody who wants to be part of this uh, you know uh, um, uh, the consortium he can actually contact us through this contact us page and we will be happy to you know uh looking at the feasibility of that particular center i think we'll be happy to make it uh, part of his consortium as i said and uh, uh, i'm again at the end i'm thankful to all the you know um 35 centers and the investigators who are part of this consortium and i think uh, that's all from uh, my side here uh, thank you very much thank you very much and uh, very warm congratulations to you ajay uh, to dr sp singh and arun uh arun the driver so i think that's uh, making something happen in india it's a matter of uh, privilege for all of us uh, we have quite a few questions which have come up dr sp singh would you like to pose the questions to dr sanyal yeah uh, you have got the questions with yeah, you we, yeah we have a lot of questions please i think the first one is from dr vidya sagar from hyderabad uh he wants to know how will you suggest to place sarulgagar oca and vitamin e along the mass spectrum and in which stage dr sanyal oh okay yeah dr sanyal how do you place sarulgagar oca and vitamin e along the mass spectrum and in which stage so it depends on what you mean by placing them in terms of the evidence the largest amount of uh, rigorous clinical trial data exists for oca uh, vitamin e next and then there is saraglitazar although saraglitazar is rapidly rising now in terms of the benefit risk profile uh, i would say that for patients who have relatively early stage disease uh, saraglitazar because of its benefits on dyslipidemia uh, is potentially uh, a, you know a very valuable drug uh, for people who have established cirrhosis given the lack of safety data in uh, or for that matter efficacy data with uh, OCA and uh, with saro in the established cirrhosis population uh, uh, vitamin e may be sort of the uh, preferred drug because of the data that's available uh, in the middle for the people who have uh, particularly very active uh, stage 3 disease there is a small niche uh, indication for the use of oca with a number of safety related caveats uh, so it all depends on the individual patient's profile uh, if a patient has a lot of cardiovascular uh, significant cardiometabolic disease surrounding the liver uh, then again saraglitazar would be the leading choice uh, beneficial choice if the patient has primarily a lot of fibrosis but the extra hepatic milieu looks pretty good uh, oca may have a certain benefit in that setting uh, thanks we have two more question which are similar so i'll put the both of them and dr sanyal you can answer them one is from dr manish does combining P, uh, ppars and fxr makes sense with different uh, mechanism of action and adverse effect profile and different effect on pathogenesis is from dr manish and the similarly dr lawrence peter from bangalore he wants to know what are the what are the possible safety concerns when you are combining saro plus oca yeah i don't know there is no evidence based right uh, because oca has not been combined with saraglitazar my knowledge uh, so uh, you know i cannot give you an evidence based answer what i can do is hypothesize and uh, the fxrs uh, do affect uh, the uh, you know uh, the, obviously the bile acid pool and whether using saraglitazar would somehow modulate the safety the safety profile of saraglitazar seems to be pretty good so you know 
you have a lot of data in type 2 diabetes uh, patients being treated with saroglitazar in India for some time. So there's a fairly substantial experience based data, uh, experience with saroglitazar in India, which indicates that the drug can be used quite safely. So more, the more important question is, does the safety profile of uh, uh, OCA change if you use them together? And the things that particularly potentially one may think about is whether the gallstone risk actually significantly changes because we don't really have a great amount of data on what happens to biliary lipid composition with sarablitazar. Uh, uh, we do know with OCA there's some increase in cholesterol saturation. And if you alter the amount of lipid transport out of the hepatocyte into the bile, uh, then potentially that could be an issue. But I think these are all hypotheses. Uh, I do not really imagine. The other is there is some data that affects, there are a lot of FXR receptors in the patient. And we know PPAR alpha component can potentially affect uh, creatinine and uh, whether uh, one may get some renal dysfunction uh, or a rise in creatinine because of a combination of PPAR alpha and FXR, that is another open question. So personally, I would very much individualize this thinking just because you have two drugs for which you have efficacy data that uh, you can just give both to the patient and your job is done. Uh, I, I would uh, recommend some caution against that approach. Other questions, Dr. Singh? Uh, can I just put in two questions which are related? I think Dr. Sujit from Calcutta has asked, if Saro has a very good liver safety profile, then uh, would if can somebody use it for compensated liver cirrhosis or F3, F4 fibrosis with fatty liver? Uh, just because it has a good liver profile in a non serotic population doesn't mean it will be the same. Because I would, I need to see what the exposure data is. Once you, I want to see the, uh, you know, a hepatic safety uh, study, which typically involves patients with child class A, with, and you know, child class A covers a lot of ground from just having some wispy nodule formation to clinically significant photohypertension, to start beginning to drop your albumin, to actually, you know, till you get to uh, decompensation. So uh, in, in a full spectrum of child class A and even some Bs and Cs, I'd like to see what the exposure levels are when you uh, expose them to saroglitazar uh, and, uh, and to make sure that we know what to do with the dosing because, for example, with OCA, we know you've got to cut the dose way back once you get into the cirrhosis uh, pool with PVC. So you really need to know all of that. So I, I, I am hesitant to give you a blanket statement. It seems reasonable that I think it's an, it's an option, but I would not just say just because, you know, words matter, you know? We say saroglitazar has great hepatic safety, but it sort of implies that you're good to go now. Don't worry about it. But it all depends on which population. And most of the data are in unselected populations. Other questions, Dr. Singh, Dr. Konar? Otherwise, I have quite a few. Sorry? Uh, do you have any questions with you that have come to you? Yes, one is from Dr. Murugan from uh, Chennai. He has asked about vitamin E in serotics role of vitamin E in patients of NASH who has gone to the cirrhotic phase. We are using it in non cirrhotics What is, can it be used in cirrhotic? Uh, if you are posing that question to Kaushal, I have got two more to pile up. They have just come in. Uh, Kaushal, one question is that, is vitamin E being an antioxidant, uh, what's the role of other antioxidants? So that somebody has asked. And the other question that has been asked is that, is vitamin E in the present form that we use it good enough or the tocophil varieties has got an advantage? So since you're going to be on that, you could cover these two. Right. So uh, regarding cirrhosis, I think the initial randomized controlled trials which were done excluded patients who had cirrhosis. So for a 
long period of time we were told that patients who have cirrhosis should not be given vitamin e because we do not have safety data but a recent uh, retrospective study which i just presented by dr chalasani's group which uh, gave vitamin e for almost uh, a median of 5.6 years and up to 10 years included about two third of patients who had cirrhosis obviously these were compensated ones and they did not and they found that it was safe and effective in these patients uh, that's all we have but this is a retrospective data we still need to have a prospective study done in cirrhosis to uh, give better answers but yes okay, another question another question for you how do you position metformin in the treatment of uh, nash associated with diabetes so uh, yeah so that's that's a very interesting question and keep people keep asking that but they must remember that all those patients who have diabetes metformin any which way is the first line treatment so all these patients any which way is are on metformin and there is data to suggest that long term use of metformin is associated both population based and retrospective data suggests that metformin use is associated with lower risk of liver cancer development but in randomized control trial where metformin has been used for nash patients it has not been shown to be effective in achieving these particular outcomes uh, out, outcomes like the short term outcomes of resolution of nash it's not been so you would recommend it for the treatment of diabetes in these patients but yeah. not particularly for nash right right i think the other questions which dr gordas chaudhary had uh, uh, brought up Uh, other antioxidants so uh, there had been studies earlier using mixture of antioxidants and even vitamin c along with other antioxidants and those trials did not found uh, did not find uh, any beneficial effect in terms of resolution of nash uh, regarding other uh, isomers or other types of vitamin e it is shown that uh, the natural forms of vitamin e are better absorbed and better assimilated because the receptors for the absorption uh, are possibly uh, there in the body both in the intestines and more amount of natural vitamin a e is able to reach the liver and brain and recently in uh, our market we have uh, a new form of vitamin e called troco troco uh, troco triphenol which are again natural derivatives of vitamin e uh, it is a smaller molecule and possibly as claimed in the studies possibly 40 to 50 times more potent uh, than the alpha tocopherol uh can i say something about the trimols yeah sure so so yes they are definitely have a much more potent uh, antioxidant effect but the tocotrienols are not used clinically for uh, because for the liver uh, because the resistance time in the liver is very low there is a uh, tocopherol transport protein uh, in the hepatocyte so that as soon as your tocopherol goes into the liver the liver tries to get rid of it and so actually the residence time in the hepatocyte is very very low and uh, that is the reason why the trienols in general have not really seen their biological effect is very short lived and uh, that is the basis for why people have most of the clinical trials in the vitamin e space have focused on tocopherols you know just because you can chemically create the molecule uh, i think a lot of work has to be done with trienols i don't think you can easily translate the data from tocopherols to trienols there is another hepatic quinone which is derived from this whole idea of a tocopherol base but it has a relatively low liver exposure but very high cns exposure so there are some developmental anomalies which are linked to uh, oxidative stress in the brain and uh, these are serious mitochondrial disorders that affect the brain development and lead to early death and uh, they have been shown to prolong survival and vetiquinone is approved for that so you know uh it is not only a matter of giving the drug but which organ it ends up in is really important and the residence time and safety profiles are linked to that 
probably what is more important in the Indian population is the haptoglobin genotype. We published a paper showing that people with a 2 allele are particularly responsive to vitamin E. And there are two studies from Israel which showed that uh, the response to um, vitamin E in people who have the 2 allele matches all the almost the effects of statins in terms of cardiovascular benefit. So if you're going to use vitamin E, there may be value to actually knowing your haptoglobin genotype which, by the way, India has a high prevalence of a two genotype. Please go ahead with the other questions. Dr. Kona, Dr. Shivram, please. Dr. Shanel, can I ask you one question? Of course. Yeah, it's about that, you know, your Simtuzumab uh, study which showed that, you know, the advanced NASH with stage 3 fibrosis, they go on to develop cirrhosis, 20% of patients that, uh, Rohit Lumma said, the rule of 20% and 20% decompensate within two years. So it's very short. That means it's a quite progressive disease compared to, let us say, hepatitis C. So do we have any way of preventing, uh, apart from uh, OCA, do you think of other ways of preventing or can we isolate these patients who are really rapid progressor to cirrhosis? Yeah, so I, I think we have to be a little careful. Uh, the way the patients who are selected for the Simtuzumab trials, uh, those who had bridging fibrosis, uh, you know, uh, at the time, you have to remember, there were no competing trials. So these were all patients that all of us had biopsied and they were sitting around waiting for a study that they could go into. Mm -hmm. So we enriched, the population was enriched for people who were a little bit, I think, further along in the course of their disease. Uh, and subsequent, and so uh, it, it turned out, so the rate of progression was about 10% per year. And I have a feeling that some of these patients, because you needed an entry biopsy within say, a certain period of time, I think six months. Uh, but I have a feeling that uh, there is bridging fibrosis and there is bridging fibrosis. You know, uh, we know just like in hepatitis C, uh, uh, Ishak 3 and 4, uh, there is a spectrum of bridging fibrosis. And I have a feeling because there were no competing trials, these are people who had already been identified there was a little bias towards people closer to the end. Uh, the subsequent studies have shown that the rate of progression is in the 5 to 8 percent uh, per year uh, once you get to bridging fibrosis. So the disease does accelerate when you get to F3. So and, you know, the reality is that F3s and F4s is a continuum. They're not clean. It's not like your whole liver has F3 and at the stroke of midnight, you know, something changes and becomes F4. So I think if you identify someone with advanced fibrosis based on a FIT4 and your fibro scan, and uh, as long as they are well compensated, there are no features of portal hypertension, I think that's the way to think about it clinically. That's the population. For them, I think an aggressive weight loss management, use of GLPs, because, you know, certainly there is some benefit. The neuraglutide trial showed five, some fibrosis benefit, even the very small yes. study. Semaglutide, there was a trend. Remember that fibrosis improvement, you know, NASH is a disease where outcomes are measured in years, sometimes decades. And even if you leave an untreated cirrhotic patient, the rate of decompensation is 3% per year or three to 4% per year, which means at 10 years, about a half, just short of half the patients will have decompensated. So we don't need to feel that, you know, there is an immediate threat to life. And I think GLP ones are certainly very viable in this space. Uh, if the safety profile permits and you don't have features of portal hypertension and your liver numbers are otherwise stable and your cardiovascular risk profile allows you to use OCA. OCA could be used. Uh, you should use whatever you can to improve atherogenic dyslipidemia, which would include some combination of statins and possibly seroglitazar. Uh, I like to use saro in this setting if I had it available here. 
think over a five rate for improvement of the dyslipidemia to add on simply because it has a we already know it has some beneficial signatures on the liver uh, which five rates do not have Arun, another question okay. to you uh, also is widely used in clinical practice uh, would you think it is safe and useful to combine vitamin e Saroglitazar and Ursu. You know, we are now believed this is like Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> I can make up anything I want, but if you have to go by evidence, there's no evidence to suggest that uh, that, that that you know is going to be any more beneficial. Uh, certainly, I think the Ursu, <clears throat> the there have been at least two or three studies looking at Ursu. There's one study from France, and there's a study from the U.S., and they're completely negative trials. So this is one drug, one disease state where ERSO really has not been shown to uh, improve the disease. Now, there is a trial that is ongoing in Europe using a compound called NOR-ERSO. NOR-ERSO is a compound that was developed by Michael Trauner to increase the hepatic exposure and residence time of ERSO. But time will have to tell whether it actually works or not. I think they're do, doing most of that study in PSC rather than NASH, but uh, time will tell whether nor ERSO. But right now, I, I'm not sure adding ERSO adds anything. It's a fairly safe drug, but uh, I think if you are diluting the bile acid pool by giving Certainly, I would not use ERSO and OCA together at this point because if you dilute the uh, bile acid pool with uh, OCA by adding ERSO in the mix, uh, whether you'll have the same efficacy, we don't know. Uh, and we also don't know whether it will change the LDL signature or some of the safety issues. So with two unknowns, then you're really out over thin ice. Uh, okay, there are a lot of uh, questions regarding safety issues of Saru uh, Ajay, yeah. do, uh, do you think there are any safety issues with Saru Dazar, number one? And can we try Saru in compensated cirrhosis? So, uh, can, I, can, I, can I just add one more? Uh, there are quite a few questions, you know, on something similar to what Arun answered. Uh, many people in practice want to know, can you combine two drugs like vitamin E with saroglitazar? Is it safe recommended? So while you are answering those questions, add this on also. Okay. Yeah, so starting with the uh, usage in serotics, I think this question was answered earlier also. I mean, we do not have any data of the usage of saroglitazar regarding its uh, efficacy as well as safety in serotics. Till that time, I think, as I said, the approval is only for F1 to F3 fibrosis with NASH. So I don't think uh, we can use it uh, in patients with cirrhosis. No, as far as, again, the combination, again, there is no data or no clinical evidence to say that vitamin E and saroglitazar, whether they will work better as far as, again, the efficacy is concerned. Uh, but then both look safe drugs. I think the safety should not be an issue. But again, there is uh, the ab absence of you know clinical data or clinical evidence. I don't think whether this combination um, would work better. And I think the lastly, um, you said about the safety issues in general about the saroglitazar. I think there are two kinds of you know data which is available. One is we know that this drug was approved for diabetic dyslipidemia and which is in market for almost eight years now. So I think hardly any side effects reported with this drug. As far as the uh, this uh, drug for fatty liver is concerned, I think we do have this histological study from India and the phase two data from US and the real life data again for around 6,000 patients from India across various centers. I think there are no major safety issues uh, with this drug. Can I pose a question to Ajay, Dr. Shivram, Dr. Acharya, and Dr. Arun? You know, when you say we don't have data, it also, the question comes up that did we look for data? So, you know, for registration trials, you want to take a very narrow spectrum of people with a disease, well-defined disease, 
and you obviously want to try one drug at a time, right? So the data that you have would obviously emerge with one drug. Now the whole lot of questions which are coming in are from people who are in day-to-day -day practice. So their concern is that if you say two are good, uh, both are individually good, then combining them, does it make it better? So what would be your intuitive answer to that? If at all you can give it, there won't be any data. So I know it's a provocative question, but that's the kind of questions which I have come. So let me put it to the wise people on the dais. Can I, can I ask a search area? Yeah, please. Can I just give a comment and talk to Arun? You see, the problem occurs, as Arun has rightly pointed out, the fatty liver disease is a spectrum. There is fat, there is inflammation, there is fibrosis, there is cirrhosis. He also has pointed out cirrhosis is heterogeneous and various states. Even inside child say it is heterogeneous. Now you have few drugs and you have all these pieces. Now with the available data, can you answer them that depending upon a fatty liver disease, now we know fibrotic mass that is F2 fibrosis or F3 fibrosis, that is progressive disease. Now that is the most risky disease. And we have an advanced stage where the goal of therapies are different. Now if we advance the cirrhosis with and without portal hypertension, the goal of therapies are distinct irrespective of the cause. Of course the cause is one of the causes progressing. Now your focus is on fibrotic mass and almost all the trials are working on this. This categorization is clear. The drug therapy is a little confusing because most recent <laughs> trial has only selectively selected fibrotic mass because that progresses. From that, if you want to answer the whole spectrum, it is difficult. As Professor Sanyal has <coughs> tried to point out and trying to answer and hypothesize. While this is true, there is a huge gap of insulin resistance and there is no drug which is attacking insulin resistance. That is the basic pathogenesis and only effect, effective therapy, as Dr. Sanyal has pointed out, is reversal of weight or exercise with diet control. <coughs> so there are a lot of gaps. It's very difficult to answer these questions and particularly with the registration trials. That's what I gather from Professor Sanyal and Ajay's talk. That you have to attack insulin resistance. Now there is a group of patients which Sibram says do not have insulin resistance. Does insulin resistance is same across the world? That is the another big gap. Now in Indian, Abhijit Choudhury has shown in an elegant study in the rural population that BMI more than 18 is a risk factor for developing fatty liver disease. Right. And their insulin levels are markedly higher than other people. Mild rise in insulin is causing right, fatty liver disease. So is the insulin resistance is different? It's very difficult to answer. But the <coughs> summary age is the spectrum. It is very heterogeneous disease. The whole ethnicity is different as Professor Sanyal pointed out. Right. So it is gradually evolving. At the moment, I think it's very difficult to answer questions. Fair enough. Fair enough. Any comments from Ajay and Arun? Yes, I think we are almost coming to the close of our time. Yeah, so uh, I, I agree. I, I, I think uh, Dr. Acharya, uh, you know, uh, is right on the money. Uh, with uh, You have to start with, you know, it's sort of a structure, the way I think about it. At the root of it is we need to really spend more time on lifestyle. We need more research. And as well as we need to spend more time with the patients and particularly those who have big NASH practices, it makes sense to engage with your uh, clinical psychology and your uh, uh, di dietary departments because we don't have the time to spend that much time as busy clinicians, but certainly those people do. And so having a multidisciplinary approach is very important. Number two, on top of that, for relatively up to stage two disease, you know, the primary threat to life is cardiometabolic uh, over a five to 10 year time frame. And so improving the cardiometabolic profile, insulin resistance 
is very important and may be sufficient in those patients. Because if you shut all those upstream things down, the downstream things will eventually get better. No rush to alter fibrosis within six months in someone who has stage two fibrosis. Uh, because the fibrosis is not going to kill them for another 10 years. For stage three is when you start changing into more of a liver disease with the more traditional fibrosis related endpoints start becoming more important. And that's where drugs that have more of a defined effect on fibrosis become uh, more valuable. So this gets layered on top of treating the background multi-system disorder. Uh, and then when you get to cirrhosis, Unfortunately, we don't have really established therapeutics in the cirrhosis space yet. And one of the things to remember is that what happens in routine clinical practice is that when you have a patient that you put on various drugs and they're cirrhotic and they suddenly decompensate, your natural tendency is that this is what happens in cirrhosis. This is the natural course of the disease patient decompensated. But what you don't know for sure is whether one of the drugs you gave actually accelerated that process. And I think where registries like icon D are going to be very, very important is once you have five, 10,000 patients in a registry being followed, you'll be able to see whether, say, combination of drug A plus drug B plus drug C in a specific population, there is a signal for increased toxicity, which you will never be able to do in the registration trials because the Focus in a registration trial is to look at one drug in a defined population to show a very specific primary endpoint, which is efficacy. Dr. Singh, any, any further questions? Uh, no, I think we have, we, have, we have covered most of the questions. Okay, fine. So, so um, I think we have come to the end of our time. Yeah, Dr. Kaushal, please. So uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to ask Dr. Sanyal, uh, since vitamin E, uh, I mean, uh, there are other drugs also available, but for quite a long time, we only had vitamin E and we got used to uh, using it in patients of NASH in various stages. And now since we have other drugs, and I, I know why people are asking this question of combination. So can we add vitamin E as a safe molecule over and above the other drugs? I know there is no evidence. I totally agree with that. But my, my of, intuition is that it will be safe to do so. But in the end, you know, there's a burden of drug therapy for the patient also. So it's fine to do it. But this is, again, for patients who are in the icon D registry to generate some real world evidence that these combinations work will be very important. And then also keeping track of safety, you know, is important. So, so vitamin E is an incredibly safe molecule uh, by and large. And uh, I, I personally think if you were to do it, you'll probably be okay. But you can't say that there's evidence to support that. It's just an opinion. Uh, but I think there's an opportunity, particularly for people enrolled in icon D to track these type of things, to make sure that there is first, no safety issue, and number two, evidence that it actually does, you know, have additive or synergistic or some other benefit. Thank you. Uh, if there are no further questions, shall we conclude? Um, I just have two slides to show. So all the people who are joining in, I think there are about 16, 1,670 people. I just want to remind you, uh, please uh, fill in the feedback form. It will just take less than uh, 30 seconds. Uh, we look forward to your feedback and that's how we can improve. If you tell us we are not doing well, it will help us to understand why and change. So please give us your feedback. We, I really value that. The, neg the next thing that I want to show you, next please. Next slide please. Yeah, so the, just mark your calendar. The next webinar is going to be the third one. will be on the 23rd of August 2020 at 4.30. And uh, this is only just to remind you that, you know, block your calendar. Uh, at the end, I would like to profusely thank uh, Dr. Arun Sanyal, Dr. Abraham Koshi, Dr. Subrat Acharya, Dr. Konar, and Dr. S.P. Singh, the big, uh, you know, the... 
uh, I would say the uh, uh, big names in hepatology in India, and of course the young brand of the Dayton carriers, Dr. Kaushal Madan, Dr. Ajay Duseja, and Dr. Manav Vadhavan, were giving us a very beautiful academic feast. And it wasn't just pure academics; it also actually showed the way as to how to weave our path in clinical challenges and how to uh, help patients. So, with that, may I request my co-host, Dr. Bansal, to kindly come in and uh, give a vote of thanks, please. Uh, Dr. Good Bansal. Everybody. Yeah. Good, good evening, everybody. Uh, so, uh, I want to uh, thank all the dignitaries, Dr. Arun Sanyal, Dr. Uh, Kausal Madan, Dr. Uh, Dr. Dusteja, and Dr. Manav Adwan. Who brilliantly presented in a very lucid uh, manner. A special thank to our, all the chairpersons. It's a matter of honor that more than 1600 uh, delegates logged in today's webinar. Thank you very much. I hope all of you enjoyed uh, today's show, and we will try to fulfill your expectation in all the next webinars. As sir uh, uh, pointed out, uh, uh, next webinar on the 23rd August. so please uh, log in on that day your feedback is very important kindly fill and uh, return to us i want to say many thanks to our organizing team our advisor and executive committee i also want to thanks our sponsors of event jaitas uh, and uh, event partners running touch thank you very much wish, uh, wish you stay safe and stay well thank you very much arun have a nice day it's early in the take morning care, for you care. all right Thank you. Looking forward to doing this in person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, but you know, it's uh, time for us to have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, guys. Stay Thank safe. You. Thank you. Bye, 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 bye. Thank you, Ajay. Bye. Thanks a lot. Hey, Kaushal. Bye. Kaushal, are you there? Kaushal.